negative talk, all the, you know, convincing myself of all the things that could go wrong and just focus on the things that could go right. And a lot of times, that's just what you need to be successful. Hey there, everybody. It's episode 30 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Master Gordon White. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also the founder of Whistlekick, makers of the world's best sparring gear, as well as awesome apparel and accessories for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank those of you returning. Don't forget our great products, like our double-layered shin guards. You can find more information about those and the rest of our products at whistlekick.com. And all of our past podcast episodes, show notes for this one, and a lot more, are over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, why don't you sign up for our newsletter? We put some good stuff in there, and we promise not to spam you or sell your address to anyone. And now to today's episode. On episode 30, we're joined by Master Gordon White, a WTF Taekwondo practitioner, instructor, school owner, organization president, and former international level gold medal competitor. That's quite the resume, and for those of you unfamiliar with Taekwondo, no, WTF doesn't stand for what you may think it does. It stands for World Taekwondo Federation, which is the style of Taekwondo sparring that's in the Olympics. Master White and I are extended Taekwondo family, as both he and my instructor trained under the same man. I guess that makes him my uncle. Well, whatever it makes him, we had a great conversation and really dug into some deep subject matter. I hope you enjoy it. And with that, Master White, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Well, it's great to have you here, and I'm glad that we finally get to talk, and um, listeners are going to hear the difference in the audio quality, and of course, people that have been listening for a while know the, the difference between the Skype interviews or the phone interviews, and this is an in-person interview, so yeah. it's fun. I get to gauge your reactions as we talk about things. and, and uh, Right, and I finally get to meet the person I've been listening to all these great podcasts, <laughs> do all the interviewing on. So. Well, cool. Cool. Yeah. That's... Uh, it's a little weird. People, you know, come up to me at events now, and and they act like we're 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 friends, and, and I'm happy to be friends with anybody. But it's kind of a one way relationship. They get to hear my voice, and some of these people. I mean, we're, this is going to be episode, um, I think, 29 or so. So these people yeah. listen to me for 25, close to 30 hours, and I don't know who they are. Yeah. Well, well, especially coming to the show after you've been. Ha- running it for so long you have 20 episodes it's kind of like you know binge watching something on netflix <laughs> you know you come and you're like oh my gosh there's 25 podcasts here about martial arts that i can listen to so you tend to consume quite a few in a short amount of time which yeah. makes you feel very familiar so. <laughs> well nice i hope people are binge watching i i know the the netflix and the hulu binge watching that i do and and if somebody's binge listening to this show that's uh that's pretty cool it's something i hadn't even thought of so yeah. thanks so how did you get started in martial arts? I mean, you're, you're a Taekwondo guy, but you know, how, how'd that get started for you? Um, well, and I'm very much a karate kid kind of a story. Uh, I got beat up a lot in the sixth grade. Mm. And um, at, the, at the time, we called it junior high. It was kind of like middle school, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And the sixth graders were um, generally picked on yeah. and uh, I seemed for whatever reason to just attract it I don't know what it was but um, and so I kind of put up with it in the sixth grade and I, I learned how to hide and avoid and just kind of survive uh, and then the seventh grade it was much better but it was still kind of a little bit was there of, of being bullied and picked on and I realized that the next year was going to be okay. Eighth grade was going to be fine, but I was going to be a freshman in high school the year after that. And then I was going to be at the bottom of the pile again. So um, I hadn't really even thought or considered doing martial arts um, until I met my sister's boyfriend uh, at the time. I had two older sisters and my older sister was at UVM um, and she had a boyfriend who was practicing Taekwondo and he said, hey, why don't you come and check out a class? I think it'd be really good for you. And so we we went um, and watched a class, and then we had an interview with the instructor, and um, there was an application to, to sign up, and there was, I don't know, 20 reasons why you wanted to practice or join the school. And so um, 
my dad, I filled it all out and my dad took the sheet and looked at it and he just looked up and he said, we'd like to sign up. And I kind of looked at him and he looks down at the sheet and he says, well, out of the 20 reasons, you, you didn't check off about two of them. So I'm thinking this is probably something that you really need to do. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I signed up, it was 1983. I think it was March 13th or May 13th, wow. something like that, yeah. right in that area. And um, I was hooked from the start. I, I, my parents claimed to have worn out a car driving from Williston to Riverside Ave and back. Um, the school that I was training at was called the American Taekwondo Center and it was run by a Korean woman um, um, who was the sister of Dae Young Kim, who is the founder of Mugang Do. So mm -hmm. for us in Vermont, we know the Mugang Do school. Um, and so I trained there very, uh, regularly for a couple of years, um, just about two and a half years. And then, um, the school moved to California. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when that happened, uh, my instructor suggested that I, I go see her brother and train in Mugong Do. So I did that. I, um, I went and joined the Mugong Do school. Um, Master Kim asked me to put a white belt back on. And having just earned my first Don, it was difficult, but mm. I did it. And I think I take it back. He actually said, well, not a white belt, put a yellow belt on. And so I was almost like, wow, okay, whatever. Yes, sir. And I just put it on and put up with it. And I think, you know, and it was fine because he didn't treat me like a yellow belt. I just think um, he just needed to see that I was going to be there and be committed to the school. And he didn't, sure want, he didn't want me to be a black belt in his school without kind of earning it or, you sure. know. Um, so nine months later, I tested for black belt there. And um, uh, it was... It was a difficult change. It was a very different school. It was a very different style. And I was used to being able to go to my instructor and ask questions and, and I could ask her anything about yeah. Taekwondo and training and what should I do. And, and, uh, he was very different and didn't just wanted you to do what he said and didn't want to have a lot of conversations. And I was very interested in competing. And so I went to him and I said, sir, you know, I'd, I'd really like to compete. Can you suggest? some things that I can do to prepare for competitions and go to tournaments. And um, he, he just didn't really want to support that. And so my mother... Uh, well, let's, let's talk about that for a yeah, second. Yeah, sure. Because you know, I, I know enough about you to know that we're going to get into this competitive sure. side and that's going to be a big part of what we're talking about. Yeah. This, but why? Why do you think he didn't want you to compete? I think the feeling I had about it then was different than now as I look back at it. Okay. So at the time, I just, I just think he saw it as a hassle and not something that he wanted in his school. And so being an instructor now and having a school with students and having a very active competition team, you know, the competition team, you put a lot of time and effort into them. You spend a lot of weekends traveling. You do a, there's a lot that goes beyond having a school and having students and training people to go from rank to rank. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that was the reason why he didn't want to get started in that realm or that he, um, he had some other reason. Sure. Um, but he just, you know, he didn't, he didn't want to support it. And it was kind of clear that, you know, he just, he didn't want me to do, he didn't want me to compete. Okay. So, or he didn't, he wanted me to compete, but I guess at like the two or three local tournaments that were, that he went to that were his friends and then his sure. friends came to his tournament kind of thing. And I, I really wanted more than that. Yep. So, um, my, my mother ended up making some phone calls and ended up contacting the United States. It was called the USTU at the time, the United States Taekwondo Union. And just a short amount of background on that. The United States Taekwondo Union was formed out of the original AAU Taekwondo organization. Um, this was all happening in the 80s and there was the push for Taekwondo to become an Olympic sport. Okay. And so one of the things that has to happen for that is 
the world governing body, so in this case, the World Taekwondo Federation, they needed to have national governing bodies. So each nation needs to have a governing body for Taekwondo. And AAU is not allowed to be a national governing body because oh, okay. it belongs to the amateur right, status right. sports. So they created a separate organization called United States Taekwondo Union, which has since been renamed to USA Taekwondo. Um, and so that was the national governing body for Taekwondo in the United States and the process for qualifying for a national team and going to the Olympics and the World Championships and the World Cups and all of the other sanctioned World Taekwondo Federation events. Sure. So my mother ended up contacting that office and they said, well, the president for the state organization for the USTU is Master Bruce Twing. And so um, my mother said, okay, great. Do you have his number? And he said, yes. And they gave him the number. My mom called him up and he said, well, I teach in Randolph and I would you know, love for you to come and visit a class and talk to you about um, what we can do. Yeah. Um, you know, this was very close to the junior nationals for the year they happened to, I think during the summer in July. And this was, uh, yeah, it was the summer of 1986. And so he said, you know, Master Twing said, you know, I'm not going to the junior nationals, but my student who is the state president for USTU in Maine is going. Um, and, you know, Gordon's welcome to go and he'll coach him. So he said, great. And my signed up and went and um, I told Master Kim at Mugung Do and um, he wasn't happy about it, but he just kind of let tell it us a, happen. Tell and... us about that conversation a little bit, <laughs> if you're okay with it. Sure, I'm, I'm okay with it. I, um, again, this is a long time ago, right? So, And, and you're, you're young then. You're I am. How old? Um, so 16, 15, 16 okay. in that range. Yeah, 13, 14. Yeah, about 15 or 16. Okay. Oh, I, I was actually just turning 16. I remember now because when we went, we drove and uh, I had my temporary license, which was a folded up piece of paper, Right. which when I got my first speeding ticket, the police officer laughed at me as he looked at it. We were over in New York. We left here. We were like three hours into the trip and I got caught in a speed trap on the oh. interstate and ended up getting... <laughs> and so um, uh, that was an <laughs> exciting part of the trip to... Welcome, welcome to my first speeding ticket. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so the thing about Master Kim, he, um, I think that he had been burned in the past by some students who were very, you know, trained very hard and were very dedicated to the school and then they wanted to do something he didn't want to do and they just left. And so I think he was being cautious about that. So. I mean, I trained every day. I went to the gym five days a week. I took two classes a day if I could. This was my life. I loved it. I, I would go early enough to hit the bag before students showed up. And I think that he really appreciated that and wanted students like that. Um, but I also think that because of maybe some things that had happened in his past, he was cautious mm. about that. And so when I started asking questions and wanting to do things that weren't necessarily his plan, I think he just started to back off a little bit. He got nervous. He didn't want to lose you. Right. I think he figured that he was going to lose me because I don't think he was willing to do what I wanted sure. to keep me. And, and um, so I don't know. I hope that doesn't sound presumptuous, but that, that I think is the, you know, the, I think that may have been what happened and I don't really know, you know, I told him, you know, unless he was here and could answer the question, right. but that was how it felt. And so I explained to him that I would be going to the, to the nationals and that we'd been in touch with Master Twing and, and he respected Master Twing, you know, very much. And that was fine. He, he, um, he didn't have anything negative to say there. And, um, so I, I went and fought and lost terribly. Um, but it was a pretty great experience. I spent, you know, it was in St. Louis and my dad and I drove, we, wow. you know, we drive. camped out a couple of nights and, cool. um, it was really fun. And I, I met, um, 
a man named uh, Dennis Morin, who was Master Twink's student and the, the man that was running the main mm -hmm. Blue Wave at the time. And he, uh, he coached me for the fight that I had there. Um, and then I got to know a lot of his students and they said, hey, we have Blue Wave summer camp in August, you should come. So after nationals and I got home and started talking to my parents some more and I said, hey, they've got this Blue Wave summer camp thing, what do you think if I go? Uh, and they said, sure. So, so uh, they brought me to Lake Willoughby and set the tent up and took off on Friday night. And there I was by myself for the weekend at Blue Wave summer camp. And, um, and during that weekend was when I realized that that's where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Master Twing was, you know, a little scary yet approachable, um, supportive you know, yet demanding. Um, and the feel that I had from that group was just such camaraderie and community. And that was what I felt was missing from my martial arts experience. Yeah. And, um, you know, the fact that he was very supportive of things I wanted to do um, didn't hurt, of course, no, sir, right? No. I mean, that's, you know, part of the part of the deal here. But um, so, you know, I got back from that summer camp and I had to sit down with my parents and, um, I said, I, I want to join the school and they being the amazing parents that they are, they said, okay, I guess we're driving to Randolph a couple of nights a week, which is 50 miles from the Richmond exit to the Randolph exit, uh, on the interstate each way. And, um, I started traveling down to Randolph to see Master Twing and, uh, and train at the Blue Wave in Randolph, which sure. is where I met your instructor, yeah. Mr. Uh, Mr. Master Rhoda. Yeah. So, and so, boy, we just took the story, story bus here for a ride. So, yeah, no, um, that's good. Yeah. That's what we do here. So, so, so then I started training in, in Randolph with Master Twing. And so, um, I guess, uh, what we were talking about is why I got started, which was, you know, the fact that I was getting picked on and, and beat up and stuff in sixth and seventh grade and realized that I wanted to be able to take care of myself and, yeah. and have some confidence going into high school. And that certainly is, you know, what ended up happening. Um, I entered high school without any fear of being picked on. Um, about three months into my freshman year, I got pushed into a corner and a whole bunch of people saw it and I never got picked on again. I was successfully able to defend myself against a much larger individual, um, which was pretty great, you know? So, I, and then after that, I just, it's funny after that, the whole aspect of self-defense for martial arts became less of a focus for me. Um, it was all about training and experience and improving. And, and quite honestly, the competition part of things was really, what was uh, exciting to me? Sure, but because you didn't need it, because you, right, you, you were you were pushed. You had to step up. You had to prove yourself. I guess is probably the best way to think of it. Back yeah. then, as a high school freshman, right, and you did, and you're you're kind of glossing over the details. So I'm guessing that you know it came to blows. I'm guessing yeah. that it did. I'm I'm happy to share the details. I just you know I I got pushed into a corner and then. Um, I can, it's crazy how long ago this is and I can still remember it very, very clearly, but you know, I was pushed into a corner and I stepped away and I just kind of gave the hands up, you know, what are you doing? I don't want to fight you. And then, um, he kind of ran at me and I stepped to the side and he went by and then he came back and, um, threw a punch at my stomach. And it was, it was just like in class. I just did a low block, a middle punch and I followed up with a front kick. <laughs> And it was literally a combination we had practiced hundreds of times up and down the floor. Yeah. And, um, and I think for a moment I was shocked. You know, here's this kid bent over on the floor in front of me and I'm looking at my hands and feet going, oh my God, that worked. That just, that just happened, you know? Yeah. Um, and then there was a little bit more of a scuffle and he kind of pushed me down and I got up and I kicked him a couple more times and um, he was pretty done and the teacher showed up and. Um, and then the teacher said, you guys need to, you know, don't fight, leave each other alone, go your separate ways. And I said, no, 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 no. He started a fight with me. I need to talk to somebody. And so, so the next day we got 
both of us got pulled into the principal's office and I was feeling like I was in the right. You know, I was like, hey, this guy started a fight and I just defended myself. And of course, the principal had to take the the line of, you know, there's no fighting in school and you guys need to be able to get along and, you know, that whole part of it. So, yeah. And I think that's a story that, I don't know if I want to say most, but at least a good number of us that have been through the martial arts, through our younger years, that we know that story. And our parents quite often know that story too, right. as they got called in. I don't know if your parents were called in and, and had to talk to the principal, but that, that whole uh -huh. dilemma of, you know, a zero tolerance for violence, which, you know, if you had held to that, what would have happened? You would have had the snot beat out of you. Right. And it's good that, you know, I think those of us that, that teach martial arts, you know, we, we hold that line a little bit differently to say, don't use it unless you have to. And you clearly had to, you were defending yourself and you did it and you did it effectively. And you took it to the point that you needed to and no further. And I don't think there's anybody listening to this podcast that wouldn't agree that you were in the right. No, I, I still, I mean, I feel like I was in the right. Absolutely. It was, um, it was a, you know, it was at the end of the day and looking back at it now, it was a, a scuffle between two, you know, 15 year olds. Um, and I think the, the outcome of that was huge for me in that I, uh, it was such a dramatic change from my sixth and seventh grade life that I suddenly mm -hmm. felt like, okay, like I don't have to be afraid. I can walk up and down the halls. I don't, you know, I'm not concerned about that. And, you know, I, like I said, enough people saw it and, you know, high school people talked right. and it was all the, the chatter the next day. But, um, did people treat you differently? Um, for, I don't think I was treated differently. No. no. And I never, like I said, I never got in another fight in high school. I, okay. you know, I was, I was pretty, I'm pretty easygoing and, you know, I like pretty much everybody and I, you know, I didn't have any problems that way at all. I just, this, this one thing happened and I, haven't, I still don't know what the, what the beef was he had with me, but, um, but yeah, so that was, that was that. And that was, a, it was a big uh, eye opener for me, I think, just in looking back at the way my life was in sixth and seventh grade and my confidence levels, and then after a couple of years of training the martial arts, you know, not that beating somebody up or defending myself w was necessary to kind of have that confidence, but it was definitely a nice bonus to kind of have proven to myself that yeah, you know, this does work. The work, you know, the the effort you're putting into this is. Is, is paying off, not just in your physical skills, but in your ability to carry yourself through school. Yeah. And I think the, the other piece I want to pull out of that, and I, I just want to underscore for people that are listening, is you fell back to something that was pretty basic. Oh, and yeah. it was a drill that you worked on many, many times. And I think a lot of us that have trained for a long time, we get bored. And that, that's actually a subject that's come up on the show a number of times, you know, as martial artists, as black belts, you know, we're not supposed to get bored. We're supposed to love this so much that it's always exciting. And, right. and we live to throw reverse punches and front kicks, <laughs> uh, even individually. Yeah. But of course, that's, that's not the case. But here we're illustrating the importance. And one of the, the lessons that I've learned, and the best way I've ever heard it expressed is you fall back to your lowest level of training, not your highest. You know, your defense wasn't jump spinning hook kicks, even though I'm sure you knew how to throw them. Right. Your defense was low block, punch, front kick. Right. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And this is, you know, the self-defense topic comes up all the time. I'm a martial arts instructor. Yeah. And being a martial arts instructor, a lot of times parents come in with their kids and they're like, well, I need him to learn how to defend himself. Do you do model mugging type stuff where, and I think that there is certainly value to kind of the realistic um, self-defense. Uh, we, you know, at a lot of our summer camps and winter camps, we do um, Tony Blower stuff, yeah. with the black suits and the, you know, and, and I think there's a lot of value to that. I would also say that the benefit of traditional martial arts for a you know, middle or high schooler in terms of defending themselves comes down to two very basic things. You know, one is that you are 
on a regular basis learning how to control distance with somebody who's trying to strike you. Mm -hmm. And the other is that you've learned how to deliver an effective strike. And so you're not going to get, you know, it's very unlikely that you're going to get bullied and into a fight with another skilled martial artist. It's just probably not going to happen. You know, at the middle school and high school levels, what we're right. talking about as traditional martial arts teacher, or teachers or, or um, you know, traditional martial arts training, that is forms and basics and, and things like that, which are absolutely beneficial, you know. How does a low block, why do you do a low block? When would you ever do that in a fight? You do, you don't realize it. It doesn't look like maybe exactly what you're doing when you go up and down the floor, but it's similar enough and the reaction is there um, that it is very effective. And that ability to just control distance and deliver an effective strike is most of the time um, all that's really necessary, I think, at that kind of age. Yeah. And, you know, it obviously gets more complicated when you're an adult and there's a robbery in a store or right. something, right? We're not right. talking about that. We're Absolutely. talking about kind of the, the basics of being able to defend yourself. Sure. So that was probably the longest origin story we've had oh, here on the show. Which, no, no, that's, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not saying that in a critical way. What's, what's great about it is you tied in about seven stories. And as you know, we're, we're all about stories. Right. Here. That's the whole focus yeah. of the show. The motto is, what's your story? Yeah. But I'm sure you've got a lot more. So I, I have a couple more I, can, okay, I well, can share with you. Throw, throw, pick your best one. Okay. And why don't you throw that at us? All right. I, uh, um, it's hard because there's so many subjects, you yeah. know. So I'd like to talk a little about uh, Master Twing, Grandmaster Twing, um, and a story with him because, okay. um, which has nothing to do with the physical training of, of martial arts, but it was a, a story that um, I think really speaks to the kind of person he was. I, it's, it's interesting, you know, Grandmaster Twing started teaching Taekwondo in the state of Vermont in 1969, right? The first Taekwondo instructor in the state. Yeah. Um, and uh, I now have students who are fourth degree black belts who've never met him. Wow. So when he passed away in 1999, um, you know, it was, it was a big change for the Blue Wave Association. And um, now that we're 15 years later to see that there's all these martial artists, Blue Wave, Taekwondo, black belts and instructors who never met him, I feel like this particular story will probably um, explain a lot about uh, you know, the, the community, the friendship, and the way we treat each other. So it's 1986 and it's my first summer camp. This is what I was talking about earlier when I decided to join Blue Wave and I visited summer camp in 1986. And yeah. so uh, my parents had helped me set the tent up and then they drove back home and left me there. And so I'm in the tent and it's, you know, I, I was very serious about this. I was like, this is this is martial arts training and we're here for the, for the weekend and you know, rah, rah. And, and so I was going to go to bed early. It was like nine 30 or 10 o'clock, you know? And I was like, well, you know, I went and saw master twang and I said, good night, sir. I'm going to go to bed. And he just kind of gave me a funny look and he said, all right, we'll see you tomorrow. So I headed off to bed and I get, you know, I'm so excited that I was having a hard time sleeping. And so I'm laying in my tent and I'm, and all of a sudden I hear some like rustling out at my tent and I'm, and there had been a, rumor that some of the black belts were going to go around and pull stakes up on the tent and so on your tent right and fold it over on you and that right. kind of thing and playing pranks so um so i hear some rustling and i kind of ignore it and i say here's some more and, I, and i'm like what is going on so i figure that someone's messing with me so i open the tent and i jump out and i'm like and i said what are you doing like kind of annoyed yeah. as i look down and see somebody with one of my tent stakes in their hand and when the face turns and looks up, it's complete shock to me that it's Master Twain. <laughs> and so he, uh, he says, man, I don't know what your parents used to put these stakes in, but that took me forever to pull out of there. <laughs> He's like, look, we'll leave your tent alone. Come help me pull these guys' tent up. So, <laughs> so we headed off and began some, some evening shenanigans um, at summer camp. But that was, 
that was who he was. He was very serious about the blue wave. He was very serious about his, his taekwondo and his teaching. Um, and he was very serious about having a good time with his students mm. and knowing that, you know, there was more to it than lining up in rank and bowing in and bowing out. Um, and so we carried that forward many years, that, that kind of attitude and that teasing of each other. And so many years later, a little more than 10 years later, actually, in 1997, summer camp had been moved to Tunbridge Fairgrounds. And um, Master Twing wanted it there because he lived in Chelsea. And so he wasn't really a fan of camping anyway, and so he could stay at home. Right. So... In 1996, about a year earlier, he'd purchased a, a laminating machine. And so we would get in the mail flyers for all these different events coming up, testing, a tournament, whatever, and everything was laminated. And so it became this little joke about, you know, what are you going to get next from Master Twing that's laminated? Right. So about, you know, so summer camp, Saturday night, um, about two in the morning, four of us crawl into a car and drive to his house and we bring with us the largest roll of plastic wrap you've ever seen and we proceed to laminate his car so in his driveway um, and so we had somebody under the car we'd pass it under and we wrap the whole thing up front to back and side to side um, and uh, and so you know the next morning everybody's out lined up at summer camp and it's like 15 minutes go by before we're supposed to start and all of a sudden he comes flying down the road in his car he pulls in he comes out and and his instructor who i can talk about later grandmaster lee he was there at the time as well and he's just laughing and laughing and so uh so master twing understood that uh you know what comes around goes around and yeah. he was uh he he told me many years later that that was one of the best practical jokes that had ever been <laughs> ever been played on him but that's kind of the um, the character of, uh, of, of summer camp and the way, you know, you spend so many years together with people doing things, you become, you know, the best of friends, you become family. And, um, you know, that was, that was who he was. He loved the practical jokes and to sure. kind of tease the people that he cared about. So I have, and you probably have to train with people that, you know, are on that end of the spectrum, the, the joking, the fun, the having a good time. And then people on the other end, and maybe your original instructor that you talked about is more on that end of the spectrum than, yeah. you know, let's do all business. Why do you feel, why do you find the value in the other side, in the fun side, the joking yeah. side? You know, is that, is that more than just enjoyable? Is that, does that yeah. fall into your teaching philosophy? So, um, it's a, it's, it can be a slippery slope. Right, so you don't want to be too familiar with your students initially because when discipline breaks down in the gym, then you've gone too far. Right, mm -hmm. so when your practices aren't efficient because people are joking, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when um, when that carries over to the training floor, then you have to be you have to be careful, and that and that can happen. Um, so you have to be careful about it, um, and I think that it it's truly. Um, a skill to learn how to balance that mm -hmm. and how to, um, y you know, keep the discipline on, on the dojong floor. And then, you know, when, it, when training is done, how to come, you know, together with your students yeah. at a level that's very human and fun. And, um, and I keep coming back to the word community because that's really what it's about. You know, you're really a family. Um, the you know the dojong's kind of like your close family, your immediate family, yeah. and then the sister schools are kind of cousins, and you know, and then you kind of get together for these events, and then it's like a family reunion. So you know, I think that you know, and in that example, you know, there's always respect for the elders, for the parents, for the grandparents, and they're still joking, right? So like the grandkids are in, and they're teasing the grandmother, and so. I think in a lot of ways it resembles that. Um, and I do think that it's an important part of, uh, of being an instructor, at least the kind of instructor that I want to be. Mm. Uh, y you know, there's, there's kind of a couple different approaches when you're, when you're a coach, right? So if we go through a, 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 you know, a coaching seminar that typically they say, you know, you can, 
You can be authoritative with your athlete and you can tell them what they need to do. You can be supportive um, you know, of them um, or you can just try to be their friend. And so you, know, you have to figure out which combination works best. And so you know, that I think is the balance. I think that's part of the reason you're called the master, right? You gotta be able to balance all sides of that. You're not just, there's lots of people who are great trainers, but maybe they're not all great masters. I don't know. Very well said. I like that. I had one other short story if you want. Yeah, no, please, <laughs> please. Um, so this is a, a competition story. And so um, in 1990, what year was that? 1996, um, I qualified to travel with the U.S. team to the World Cup in Brazil, which is a big event. And um, I'd been to a couple other international events with the U.S. team, and it had been my goal um, in my competitive, one of my competitive goals to, to medal at a World Taekwondo Federation sanctioned event. And so um, not an open, you know, not an invitational, but, you know, World Championships or World Cup or you know yeah. Pan American Championships, the Olympics, something that is sanctioned by the World Taekwondo Federation as an official event. And so I was feeling in that this was really going to be probably my best shot to do that. I was, you know, the timing was right. I was in a good place in my in my competition uh, career, and um, things were things were going very well for me. And so I traveled with the U.S. team to Brazil, and my first uh, fight ended up being against Mexico. And I was, you know, I did not know I hadn't been going to tons and tons of international events, like some of the extremely, um, successful competitors at the time. They were there every year, every event, you know, and I would get, get on a team once in a while and get to go to an event, you know, so, um, successful, but, you know, certainly not at the same level of some of the very, you know, elite athletes who were doing, everything. Um, and so I was, you know, I was nervous, I was excited, but I was really determined I wanted this to be a good event for me. And so I, my first fight was against Mexico. And so one of my teammates pulls me aside and says, oh, Gordon, no problem. I know this guy from Mexico. I've seen him fight. Um, if you can get a headshot early, you're going to destroy his confidence. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll have a much better fight with him if you can kind of score early and especially a headshot. He's kind of a head case, you know, if you, you know, he's very good, but you know, he's, you know, I think you can probably, you know, get, get in on the emotional level with him a little bit, mm. you know, and try to, so I, I trusted this guy, he'd been around. And so I got out on the floor and, um, I don't remember planning it, but I ended up scoring a nice ax kick, like right out of the gate and sure enough, I get through the fight and we're having a good fight. And I, I ended up, you know, winning the match. And, um, so I get off the mat and I come back and I'm like, wow, you know, thanks so much. That was such good advice. I said, I'm surprised though. You know, he seemed, he seemed pretty good. And he goes, oh, that was uh, William de Jesus. He actually won the gold medal at the Olympics in 1992. <laughs> and I was like, so why is he a head case if you kick him in the head early? And he goes, oh, he's not. I just told you that. And so I kind of went out and he said, you know, sometimes you just need to believe something and, and, uh, you know, give yourself a little step up. And so I was always grateful for that little bit of advice that kind of, you know, it was a little bit of a white lie, I guess, but it was, you know, it worked for me. And, um, and I, I always fall back on that story because for other parts of my life where, you know, sometimes you just have to believe, you know, if I remove all of the the doubt, if I remove all of the, 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 the negative talk, all the, you know, convincing myself of all the things that could go wrong and just focus on the things that could go right. And a lot of times that's just what you need to be successful. So that's a great story. I like that. And I, Thanks. you know, I really felt like I was there with you and, and <laughs> there was almost this visceral response for me when you <laughs> kind of gave the punchline. Oh, he lied. He yeah. lied to me. Yeah. Oh, not me. I wasn't there. This was you. <laughs> but wow, that's, that's really cool. Now, do you employ that tactic with your students? Um, I haven't had an opportunity to do exactly that, but I'm, I'm big with my, with my competitors. Um, you know, my big pep talk is about focusing on the things you can control and not the things you can't. Mm -hmm. So I spent, you know, many years losing 
at national level competitions because I convinced myself that I wasn't going to win. Mm. Um, you know, you watch the competitors there, you, you, you see bad calls being made, you see the guy you're going to fight kicking paddles and you think he's way faster than you. You know, those are all things you can't control. And so my pep talk a lot of times falls to that, which is, you know, you've been training hard, you're smart in the ring, you know, you can kick fast. Those are the things we can control. We can't control who your opponent's going to be. We can't control whether the judges like your points. We can't control those things. Focus on the stuff we can control. We can control you and your performance. The rest of it has to take care of itself. And clearly anybody can have their day. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So think about all of your time in the martial arts. And, and if you had to imagine yourself now without the martial arts, was people that have listened for a while know that I'm tweaking this question a little bit. Right. How do you think you'd be different at your age? You know, everything else is the same, maybe right. same job, same place, but no martial arts. You'd never gotten in. How might you be a different person? That's a hard question. Um, because I've been doing the martial arts for so long, I thought, you know, I get to see the question. I got to see the questions before this, so I thought about that question, yeah. and my, you know, my response was going to be, it's very difficult to kind of separate, yeah. you know, how the martial arts has impacted my life versus just my life because you can't, right? You know, and that's been everybody's right. answer, so right. that's why I'm, you know, yeah. I, I like this question. I like where, where it tries to right. go. But I'm trying so. To um, I had amazing parents and two fantastic older sisters and a very strong family unit. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, I think that I would be a very similar person in terms of my morality and my character and you know, how happy I am and, um, and those types of things. And I, I don't, I don't think that there'd be a big difference. Um, and I, in kind of the person I am at my core, um, I think that I would be involved in some other, um, athletic endeavor. I don't know what it would be. Um, I did, you know, my, my the middle child, my older sister, but the younger of the two, uh, was a, you know, is a, a fantastic athlete. She was, um, an Olympian. She went to the 92 Olympics for Nordic skiing. I mean, so for a long time growing up, I was kind of in her footsteps. I went to all the bike races that she did. I went to the dry land training that she did. And we played soccer on Sundays. And, um, and she, uh, you know, was a real a role model for me. Mm -hmm. And so I think I probably would have, if I hadn't found Taekwondo, I probably would have tried to pursue something else um, athletic, athletically. Um, so... Um, it's, it's a very difficult question. I mean, I met my wife through Taekwondo, you know, so, um, is that a, is that a good story? <laughs> I don't know. It's, a, it's, it's semi-interesting maybe. Yeah. yeah. So I, uh, I was graduating from UVM and I went to a tournament in Connecticut and, uh, I had a job lined up, um, in Boston. Uh, it was a nine month, you know, contract basis job to kind of get my foot in the door. And, um, so I'm at this, at this tournament and I'm, you know, I'm thinking about where am I going to train when I'm living in Boston and, uh, Master Twing had said, you know, oh, see if you can talk to some people and figure out where there's some gyms down there. And, and so, um, I ended up, um, having a conversation with, uh, these, um, this team of four women from JH Kim Taekwondo, which was right in Boston, literally around the corner from Fenway Park. Oh, cool. And so, um, and so my, my wife was one of them and I, I met her at this tournament. And, um, so I don't, I mean, we definitely felt something then, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I, um, so I was kind of a chicken in the dating world, I guess. I don't know. But so I ended up moving down to Boston and ended up finding an apartment that was 
um, in Kenmore Square and walking distance to the Taekwondo school. Yeah. And so I contacted her when I got there and I said, hey, so I've moved down here. Can I come visit the school? And she was actually instructing uh, at the school. I don't know if you know anything about J.H. Kim Taekwondo in Boston, but the Boston school is, it, I mean, I think it had in its heyday, it probably had a thousand students. Wow. It's probably come down to maybe seven or 800, but it's still huge. It's a giant, giant school. And they've got, you know, three training floors and um, it's a wonderful place for advanced practitioners because you can go and train and not have to take a class to get your training in. There's a heavy bag, there's mirrors, there's some equipment, there's a place to stretch, there's a place to do forms. And so, um, you know, there's lots of classes to take too, but if you want to just go get a martial arts workout, you've got that facility. Um, so I met her and started training with the team there. Um, the school is big enough that um, uh, Master Kim actually would hire new uh, graduates from the Taekwondo physical education programs in Korea and bring them over to do teaching. Wow. So we had some exceptional coaches um, you know, uh, during the time that I was there to train with. And so we you know, started hanging out socially and then dated and then moved in. And then we moved back to Vermont and got, got married. Cool. So it's a great story. Yeah. I always like when people come together through martial arts, you know, I've, I've known a few that, uh, actually we, um, what was that episode 21, 22, uh, since Katie Murphy oh, met yeah. her husband through a summer camp. Right. So yeah. cool. Yeah. It's always fun when that gets to happen. So we've talked about a lot of positives. Mm. So let's let's kind of flip it. Let's go the other way. Think about a rough point, something you struggled with, and how your martial arts training or experience allowed you to move past it. Well, um, I I have given this question some thought, and I I didn't come up with a lot of great stuff. I just because I think for the same reason where it's difficult to to think about the kind of the person that I am uh, without martial arts. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if the things that helped me in tough spots were because of my martial arts training. Um, but one particular story comes to mind about this, which um, was in 1990, I believe. It had been three or four years of nationals not getting on the podium, mm -hmm. you know, losing first fight, second fight, quarterfinals. Um, and so in 1990, I felt like this was going to be my year. I was going to place this year. I was going to have a, I was going to have a good event. And I ended up losing, I think in the quarters. And, um, so Grandmaster Lee, I have to kind of bring him into this story. So Grandmaster Taesung Lee, uh, was Grandmaster Twing's instructor. Mm -hmm. So the story is that they, when Master Twing was at, at Osan Air Force Base uh, in, in Korea, when he was in the, air, uh, in the military, he was stationed there in the early 60s, he met uh, Grandmaster Lee at the Chongdokwan school on base. And they, you know, that's, they spent a lot of time together and trained together and lost contact after he left Osan and came back to the States and then were reunited in the mid eighties, um, which is when Grandmaster Lee started visiting the blue wave mm -hmm. and coming back to the States. And so Grandmaster Lee had really taken me on as somebody interested in learning the WTF style of sparring because the blue wave up until that point had done all ITF style, um, Taekwondo. So I had a very close relationship with him. I spent many weekends, um, at Master Twing's house, getting up and training in the yard with Grandmaster Lee. And, um, so he was, um, he was very much my instructor, um, in a, in a different way than Grandmaster Twing was. It was very much a kind of a father grandfather, uh, relationship, um, you know, between Master Twing and Master Lee and me. So here it is 1990. I had put, you know, my, heart and soul into my training. And the thing about the process at the time to make the national team was that you first went to a state event and you qualified for nationals, which was very easy, especially in Vermont, mm. basically showed up. 
right? <laughs> right? There wasn't a lot of depth in the divisions. And then you'd go to qualified at nationals. And then if you place in the top four at nationals, you were invited back to team trials. And team trials is where they took the top four people from nationals and the previous year's team member and you round robin. Mm. And then the winner of that event was, the, was on the national team. Just one? Just one. And they had B team. Um, so the second place person at team trials was alternate or B team. And a lot of times that they would have other events for you to go to. Sure. So um, I'd been going to nationals since 1986 and now it was 1990. And I was feeling like I put a lot of time into this and it was time for me to place. And uh, I didn't. I lost and it, you know, I was on the podium and I just sat down and started, you know, I got out into the hall and I sat down in a chair and just kind of lost it. I started crying and I was like fed up and I was going to be done. And yeah. um, it was a really, it was a tough, tough place to be. And it was, um, you know, I think it was tough because you had so much in it for so many reasons. It wasn't just about me. It was, you know, about all my parents' support and all of the instructor support and letting those people down and not feeling like I was doing what I needed to do. And so... <laughs> so Master Twain comes over and he just kind of stands in front of me and he turns to another black belt and he says, go get his bag. We need to get him out of here. And so very protective, very, you know, we're going to take care of Gordon. He's in a tough spot. And then Master Lee walks over and Master Lee walks over and looks down and he says, what are you doing? And I said, I just kind of looked up and he goes, are you crying? He says, you want to cry? You can cry. He said, but then we're going to train some more because that's what you do when you lose. You train some more. And then he walked away. And I was like, you know, that's what you do when you lose. You train some more. And it just made so much sense to me at the time. And it really snapped me out of it. And it brought me back to some lessons I'd learned from my sister about some conversations we'd had about training and preparing for big events and not reaching your goal and about realizing that it's about the process. You know, you put, your, you put your sights on the goal and if you don't stop to enjoy the process along the way and you finally reach it, it's not, it's not really that great. You know, you gotta make sure that you enjoy it along the way. If you don't love the hours you have to put in the gym, the sacrifices you make, you know, the school dances you give up, for Friday night training practice or, you know, the time that you give up with friends to go train or the six hours you spend in a car to drive to some place in Maine to fight one guy, right. you know, if you don't enjoy all that, then at the end, it's not really worth it. And so when you don't reach your goal, you got to remember that it's about that process. It's about enjoying it and realizing that, you know, every hour in the gym, is making you better, making you stronger, and pushing you forward. And that's really the goal, is just to make sure you're still going forward. Yeah. That's, you know, I think the thing that was most striking for me as you were telling that story was it was really clear you were bringing yourself back to that place. <laughs> and, you know, we've, we've considered making this a video podcast, and of course we haven't because it's so much more complicated. But in that moment that you were telling that story, I kind of wish we had because your face changed, your whole demeanor changed. And it's something that I wish the listeners were able to see. And maybe, maybe they, they were able to hear it, but how hard that was on you. But at the same time, how pivotal that moment was. Yeah. As soon as you were speaking what Grandmaster Lee told you about, you know, okay, you cry, but then we train. Right. And even in retelling the story, there was that epiphany all over again for you. Right. And just that everything came back to normal for you. I mean, you're, 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 you came back up, your posture came back up, um, and you looked like you were ready to take on the world again. Right. <laughs> and I really hope listeners, I mean, maybe even rewind the last five minutes or so and listen to that part again, because I think there's a... a something really brilliant in there, especially in its simplicity. So that's great. We've kind of covered a couple of these questions already, so I'm going to 
skip over them. I mean, the competition, we've talked a lot about that. So I don't think we need to go there specifically. So we're going to jump into the, the who would you want to train with okay. question. Okay. Sure. So you've been fortunate. I mean, you've trained with, you know, of course, I trained Taekwondo in Vermont, so I know a lot of these names. Haven't met all of right. these people, but um, have heard a lot of stories about these folks. So it's kind of a who's who of Vermont Taekwondo and, and, and even a bit beyond. But who haven't you trained with? Who, you know, living or dead, who would you want to jump out on the mats with right now and, and learn from? I think there's uh, there's quite a few people that I would like to I would have I would have at least like to observe or um, you know maybe in my prime experience training with sure. um, certainly the founder of of Chengdu Kwan. So for people that aren't familiar with kind of the Kwan system of of Taekwondo, so before Taekwondo was formed there were all these Kwans in Korea, right? So there was, you know, you know about seven major ones, but Chengdu Kwan and Muda Kwan, Jida Kwan, Sangmu Kwan, right? There was Chengdu Kwan, there was a bunch of different ones. Um, Chengdu Kwan, when translated, is Gym of the Blue Wave, right? So that's where the Blue Wave name comes from. Um, and so the founder of Chengdu Kwan is a man named um, Wan Kuk Lee. And so I, you know, Obviously, I, I would have loved to, I'd love to have trained with him. Um, I think back when Grandmaster Lee was training, you know, I think that era, it was just so different. It looked, it was actually a lot more like Japanese karate, right? Because yeah. the influence of Japanese karate on, on those pioneers, really, the Taekwondo pioneers or the, or the, the Kwan founders. Um, if you look at the old photos, they're wearing absolutely, geese. Absolutely, right. You know, they, they look like, like Japanese karate. I mean, I, I trained Shotokan mm -hmm. karate for a while, and they yeah. look like old Shotokan. Right. Because, you know, the stances even. Yeah. yeah, and I, you know, and then um, kind of the second man in charge of Chongdo Kwan is a man named um, uh, Wan Kyu Um. And so Grandmaster Lee really trained with him a lot, and he was kind of known for uh, being one of the creators of jumping kicks. And so there's this fantastic picture of him like jumping over a bicycle doing a flying side kick. And it's like one of, you know, it, you know, flying kicks and jumping kicks clearly had been done before, but you know, to kind of really dig into them and do them and make them more commonplace, um, certainly in that school uh, was something that was credited to him. Um, he's still alive. Uh, I've met him several times, um, but again, kind of back in the back in the day yeah. of of when those guys were training and Taekwondo was really being formed. Um, you know, there's a there's um, there's a lot of you know arguments, I guess, or is the best word, or differences of opinion around the history of of Taekwondo, and I'm not interested in in that. I think you know somewhere. Um, between everyone's version lies the truth, um, you know, and so clearly General Che was, um, you know, in very involved and pivotal in, in pushing Taekwondo as a, um, as the national sport and martial art of Korea. Um, but I think what's often lost is that in that story is that he was really no more than a Kwan founder um, of ITF style Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. So you see men like Wan Kuk Lee and other founders of the various Kwans who really had more training than General Che did at the time of all of the kind of the, the gelling of Taekwondo and the coming together of the various um, Kwans um, to, to form what we call Taekwondo today. And so when you see the differences between ITF and WTF style Taekwondo, a lot of times the ITF Taekwondo to me looks closer to karate than it really does to WTF style Taekwondo a lot of times. Right. Um, and um, again, I'm not 
picking a fight or anything like that or, or casting you know judgment but i um i think that there were a lot of people that were involved in what taekwondo looks like today yeah. and it certainly um you know isn't something that can be um you know attributed to a single person there are politics everywhere absolutely yeah, yeah. E e even in and, and um some might even say especially in yeah martial arts right master twing used to say well, the only thing more messed up than religion is martial arts. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I like that. That's good. So let's get into some of the more, more fun questions. Okay. We've, we've gone pretty deep. I think we've got a pretty good sense of who you are and what made you the way you are, you know, with your passion for the martial arts. But let's talk about movies. Yeah. Sure. You, you a movie guy? You I am. Martial arts yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You got it. You got it. I've been thinking favorite? about this one because there's way too many. <laughs> there's so I, many. I, I, I sadly, I'm, I'm a fan of the older cheesy versions of martial art movies. I love like, oh God, I, The Last Dragon. I watched about a thousand times because that was, you know, I was the target audience for that at the time it came out. Sure. Big Trouble in Little China. You know, yeah, I love the kind of that stuff. Bloodsport was another big one that we watched over and over again. Um, I think current ones, I like the Ip Man series. So good. Yeah, I think those are really great. Are, are you uh, up on the third one that's coming out? I saw the trailer. Yeah, definitely. Which trailer? Oh boy, I don't know. I'm not sure. So, so the one that I think has me most pumped up because it's, it could be so wonderful and yet so ridiculous at the same time is, is the it? fact that Mike Tyson's going to yeah, be Yeah, I did see right? that. Yeah. So... <laughs> you know, of course, who knows when people are, are, are listening to this, so they may have already seen it and said, right. oh, my God, it man was great up until three when they right. brought in Mike Tyson. But <laughs> I know, I'm anxious to see it. I think that'll be good. So I don't know. I'm a, I'm a fan of most of the, the, the bigger ones. You know, I love all the Jackie Chan and Jet Li stuff. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's in Jason Statham stuff. I like that, too. You know? Yeah. So, all, yeah, it, you know, good. there's another one to mention, Jason Statham. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's... Uh, He's probably the, the most mentioned non quote unquote martial artist right. that people talk about. And, yeah. you know, it, for, for anyone that hasn't watched, especially his early stuff, you know, that the, the transporter, you know, go back and watch some of the, those fight scenes right. and you just look at him and, you know, especially knowing him now and seeing all the stuff that he's done and, um, you know, what's the movie that, that, he did recently with Melissa McCarthy's Spy. Oh, right. You know, which right. is a comedy and it's yeah. kind of ridiculous, but then to watch him really putting it together and yeah. <laughs> beating the hell out of people right. with <laughs> technique that, you know, we, we as martial artists look at and say, that's pretty darn good. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, you definitely. Know, it's nice to see somebody who can, and again, opinions vary, but I mean, he can act and do martial arts, right. right? So it's nice to see that combination. We don't always get that in martial arts no, films, do we? we do not. We, we, and the priority is usually on the martial arts <laughs> it is, over the yeah. acting. It's kind of fun to see some of the, um, well, certainly, um, well, Ronda Rousey now has made a, a couple of uh, um, uh, debuts, right, in the movies. Yeah. And um, who's the other female MMA fighter? Gina Carano. Gina, yeah, she was yep. in a couple of movies as well, right? So um, it's kind of fun to see some MMA, MMA fighters come in. and Yeah. Be. I remember when uh, Steven Seagal's first movies came out and everyone was like, you know, because at the time, I, I mean, I at my high school had started the martial arts club and mm -hmm. there was everybody, you know, from Kempo guys to karate guys, Taekwondo to Aikido people were in there. And oh, cool. the Aikido guys were all like, you know, how are they, how is he going to use Aikido as an offensive martial art? It's just not possible, you know? And, and I went and saw the movie and everyone's jaws was just dropped because it was like really violent and really yeah. aggressive. And it looked awesome on screen. It just, his, his and like Above the Law was the first one that kind of came yeah. out and really um, brought Aikido to the screen. And I, I have to say it was pretty awesome. I think people that st see Steven Seagal now or or even his his later movies, I think it's a shame. I think that's going to be his legacy, and I I too remember his early stuff and watching it and just being blown away because he's the first person that I remember 
bringing that kind of grappling fighting style right. to the movies, and and it worked, and yeah. it looked good. And as a as a striker, you know, at the time I'd only done karate with a little bit of grappling through self defense. Sure. I was just I, I was entranced. I thought it was amazing. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I thought it was it was different enough and very cool. You know, yeah. it wasn't the same old right. you know sidekick the guy out the window. Right. You know, so. So if I had to pin you down for a favorite actor. Oh, man. Boy, favorite martial arts actor or just favorite actor? I don't know. I don't know if I can name one. I'm trying to think. I guess I'd have to pick Jackie Chan. He's just yeah. so diverse and um, he's just done so many things. I think about, think about the combination of of acting skills and, yeah. and acrobatic and martial arts stuff. I, I think I'd probably have to pick him. And he brings such a sense of humor Absolutely. to his movies that I really like. And I think one of my favorite things about a Jackie Chan movie is the outtakes at the end where you get to yeah. see him. You know, I distinctly remember, I'm pretty sure it's Rumble in the Bronx with the ladder. You, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. And for anyone that hasn't, am I right? Is it Rumble in the Bronx I think with so. the ladder? Yeah. So, for those that haven't seen the movie, first, shame on you, because it's a, it's a great movie and you need to go see it. But there's this fight scene where he's using this ladder as a weapon. And it's one of the most creative things that I've ever seen martial arts-wise on film. But of course, with those outtakes, he screws up so badly and what looks to be so painfully so many times. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a scene, I can't remember if it's that particular movie where he's supposed to slide down behind a pinball machine and there's somebody who's fighting him who pushes the pinball machine and tries to squish him against the wall yeah. and he's supposed to slide down and he just doesn't quite make it in the <laughs> outtake and gets his head oh. you know his forehead drilled against the wall with a pinball machine of yeah. all things but that was probably my first the, the big brawl was yeah. like his first american made yep, so. movie and that i must have watched that a thousand times i love that movie the big brawl was a great film so how about books are you a reader i am not as much as i'd like to be but um you know i like the classics i think every martial artist should read um you know karate do you know way of life and i think uh zen and the martial arts mm. and um, you know, I think, I think those are fantastic and they're quick and easy reads. Um, some books that haven't been mentioned on your show, at least from many of the podcasts I listen to, I haven't heard that I think are great. Um, I really like, uh, I'm going to get the name wrong. It's either, I think it's angry white pajamas. It's called, okay. <laughs> um, it's a fantastic story. It's, it's, uh, the true story about, um, a i think it's i think it's a guy from from england who spends a year or more in japan and having no previous martial arts experience joins an aikido school and it is it is a fantastic read i would highly okay. recommend it is it's it a, funny i mean it's, it's certainly a funny title it's, it is it's okay. funny yeah it's very funny um i I think not specifically martial arts books, but the recent, recently I've, uh, like recently, I've kind of been studying this, this book for the last uh, year and a half or so. It's called um, The Little Book of Talent. And mm. it's by a man named, uh, I think it's Daniel Coyle is the author. But this guy was hired to go and travel the world and visit hotbeds of training facilities that produced um, you know, high performing people. Mm -hmm. And it was every, it was not just sports, it was music and math and lots of different, um, areas. And, um, he visited a, you know, beat up tennis club in Russia that, um, has just produced more, um, you know, top players mm -hmm. than most countries have. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I think he went to the Suzuki violin uh, headquarters. And so he was hired to basically go and travel around to all these places and then write about them. And he wrote a book called The Talent Code. And The Talent Code is an interesting book, but it's a, it could be a little heavy. Um, and he, along the, 
along the way while writing this book, he came up with tips. And he wrote the second book called The Little Book of Talent, which is 52 tips that he's, he picked up from traveling to all these different training facilities. Um, and I think as, a, as an instructor, that book is, um, is really beneficial. It just forces you to kind of look at um, the way you teach, the methods that you teach. Are you doing things because that's the way you've always done them? Is there a different way? Is there a better sure. way? Um, and I, so as a, if, you know, for the instructors, certainly, I think anybody can benefit from it because it's very applicable to lots of things, but the little book of talent I would recommend. Cool. Um, and then one other book that I read a little while ago is, uh, an instructor called, uh, by the name of Kelly Moore, I think M-U-I-R, but she wrote a very short book called Instructor Revolution, um, which, you know, she has extremely successful school in Columbus. It's only, uh, I think it's under 18 years old only. Mm. Um, and she basically was tired of kind of, you know, the commercial martial arts schools that were belt factories, mm. you know, cranking out students that didn't really have any skill level um, uh, and just kind of cuts through it and has an approach that, you know, I don't buy into wholesale, but I think she has some really great points. I think again, it's, it's definitely worth a read. It's a short one and it's, it's well written. Cool. How about goals? What do you got for goals? Oh, well, I have a lot of, I have a lot of goals for my students. So I have a lot of, you know, I have a lot of things I'd like to see my students accomplish and I'd like to, to help them accomplish them. You know, I've got, a very wide range of, of students here, kids, adults, you know, people that just want to train in the martial arts and are working towards their black belt. I have, you know, athletes who want to who have competitive goals. Uh, I've got people who have fitness goals who are just trying to improve flexibility or range of motion or, um, you know, when I see what I'm doing contribute to my students accomplishing things, I, I feel a little bit like that's reaching something for me too. Mm -hmm. On a personal level, you know, I, I've just moved my school after being in downtown Burlington for 15 years. I'm now up here on Dorset Street. Um, you know, I have a goal of this school being successful and, and, and being successful the way I want to teach. I don't, I've never taught uh, my school to, to survive on the income. I've always had a day job. And, um, you know, that paid the bills and provided insurance. And I think that's given me a lot of flexibility um, in teaching the kind of school that I want to teach and producing the kind of students that I want to teach. I don't have to, um, you know, I don't have to go out and find students and do a lot of, um, you know, more commercial or promotional things, I guess, and kind of give up. Um, more of the way that I want to teach the kind of classes that I want to have. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's a goal is to make this school successful while maintaining my... What does that mean, though? What, what does success <laughs> what does that success mean? mean to you? Um, it would mean, I guess, you know, you know, I, uh, there's... I guess it would mean having more students than I have now. I mean, I, you know, I'm happy to share my student base. I'm, I'm around 70 or 75 students. And, you know, I'd love to see my gym at 100 students. I think that's probably a good goal. Um, so there's definitely a goal in kind of building, okay. building the student base um, for me. And there's, um, you know, there's, there's benefits in that in, in that it's just a lot more fun to have full classes, yeah. you know? Um, we have a lot of depth here. I have 30 active black belts. Cool. Um, and I, I want to provide opportunities for my advanced students to be able to continue to learn and grow and, and have opportunities to, to, to do things. And one of the ways to do that is to have an active school. Sure. So that's definitely... I think that's right up there for my martial arts goals. Yeah. So now's your chance to kind of, I guess, promote 
yourself. You know, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, right. or maybe they're visiting the area, they yeah. move up to Vermont, they want to go to UVM, they want to come train some WTF, sure, Taekwondo. You know, yeah. would you be open to that? How would Absolutely. they get a hold of you? Yeah, and... no, I'm I'm online at. You know, you can go to the website for our organization, which is bluewavetkd.com. And uh, you can Google search Gordon White and Taekwondo. I think mm-hmm. I'm about the only one that comes up, at least in the top few results anyway. Uh, G White at bluewavetkd.com is my email address. Um, you know, or... But yeah, I love visitors. Um, got people that come in a lot you know we get we tend to get a lot of visitors if people are in town because we're really about the only school that does wtf style taekwondo so if they're looking for a wtf style taekwondo school then they tend to come here if they're at uvm then there's a uvm club that also does wtf style taekwondo um you know i have for you know one of the things that master twang asked me to do as um i was finishing my competition career and um he got sick and it was going to be it was clear that i was kind of in a position of leadership with the blue wave association Uh, one of the things that he asked me to do was to take what i'd learned you know you know i i feel like i was selfish for a long time it was about me for a long time i trained i competed i learned i went to seminars i traveled and you know, not everybody gets to do that. And so I think that I had so much support from Master Twing in doing that stuff that I really wanted to give that back. And that was something that he saw too. And so he basically said to me, look, you need to take all that stuff that elite athletes are doing and you need to make it work for recreational students. We need a sparring curriculum that is fun and safe and that everybody can do and learn. And if we're going to be able to to teach this to everyone, you need to be able to present it in a way that everybody can do. And so, you know, I've, that was, that's essentially my, you know, a big part of what I've done in the last decade, um, the last two decades is really create a curriculum around Olympic style sparring for everyone. And so um, I have taught many, many seminars um, at schools that want to try to integrate Olympic style sparring. I'm totally open to being available uh, for going and doing seminars on Olympic sparring. Okay, great. um, If people have an interest in that. Yeah. That that sounds like some great stuff. And so, of course, you know, listeners know we'll have all these links and everything up on the website at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com and and your email address and the link to the website. So if people want to get a hold of you and find out more or, or bring you in the Right. Teach some stuff. I'm sure great. Be great. Yeah, definitely open to that. So let's let's tie it all up. You got any last words of wisdom <laughs> for everybody? Oh, I had to I had to think about that a little bit, and because there's a lot of things. It depends on the subject. It depends on the student. It depends on the audience, right? But I guess I have a couple things that came to mind. One was something um, that I'm I'm stealing. Uh, from a book I wrote, which which is a phrase, it's it's keep your you know eyes off the belt. Um, so mm-hmm. I think as martial arts students, a lot of times, a lot of emphasis on the belt and what belt you are and what your next belt is and what you're learning to get your next belt. And I think that there's value in that. And I think that it can sometimes. And I think you know the the process of earning belts and moving towards black belt is a good one. Um, but I also think that it, if it's, if there's too much focus on it, there's a lot that is lost around just doing the work to improve. You know, you learn front kick when you're a white belt, but when you test for black belt, the front kick should look a lot different than when you did it as a white belt, right? So I think sometimes people are like, oh, I know how to do front kick. Check. And they're not continuing to develop and evolve that technique for themselves. And then when they go and test for black belt, they know a lot of things, but at a very limited level, right. you know? So I think, you know, be a good student, dig deep, put the time in, do the reps. You yeah. know, I'm all about the reps. I, I'm, you know, I don't care if my athletes have done a hundred slide back roundhouse kicks in one night, we're going to do them again the next night, you know, because it's just so important. So, um, you know, I think 
eyes off the belt a little bit and yeah. focus on the skill set. Are you improving? Are you getting better? You know, the belts come. You show up at the gym long enough and you put your time in, the belts come. But are you improving? Are you growing? Right. Um, and My, then, oh, sorry. sorry. I, I just, you reminded me of something that I probably haven't even thought of in 20 years. Uh, my original instructors, when if there was a kid that seemed a little bit too focused on their, their belt, they had just got their belt or they were obsessing over their next belt, they would make them take off their belt and say, are you any different? And of course the answer is no. Right. You know, it's, yeah. it's just a belt. So, right. sorry, I just wanted that's, to share that because no, it great. was like, oh, I, I just remember that. No, no, that's great. That's great. Um, and then the other point I guess I want to make, and uh, I don't know if this is advice so much as it's just kind of a question to put out there is, you know, my background is, uh, is very, you know, I have a lot of competition background and now I have nearly as much coaching background. Mm -hmm. Um, and a problem or a challenge that I run into all the time, um, with athletes is big fish in a little pond, small fish in a big pond. Yeah. And I think that what's really important is that people kind of look hard at themselves and they ask themselves what they want for starters. And if what they want is to be a big fish in a little pond, that's fine. They just should recognize that that's what that is. And if they want more, then they have to understand and be willing to accept that they're going to be a small fish in a bigger pond. Right. And that there's, you know, value in both of those things and there's lessons to be learned in all of it. Um, but don't wake up 10 years later and look back and wish you had tried to be a small fish in a big pond. You know what I mean? Yeah. Don't just kind of settle into what's comfortable, you know, just doing what you always do, doing the, you know, going to, um, safe events, you know, um, challenge yourself, go out, step up because, you know, you, you know, you, you there's something to be learned from all of it. Goldfish grow to the size of their bowl. All right. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, okay. Master Roy, thank you. This has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate your time and you know, we got into some good stuff and some pretty deep stuff, and I appreciate you being so open and honest. With Thank us you very much. It. I really enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to episode 30 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Master White. So head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes. And while you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. And if you could help us by leaving a five-star review wherever you download your podcast, it would really make a difference. It's those reviews that help new listeners find the show, and you might hear us read yours on the air. If we do, go ahead and email us at info at whistlekick.com, and you'll get a free thank you pack, including some great stuff. Shirts, stickers, water bottles... We won't promise what's in it, but it's going to be great, and we're going to pay the shipping. Please, don't forget to tell your friends about the show. Word of mouth is the way that this show's been growing the most, and your help there is really appreciated. And check out the great stuff we have at Whistlekick.com. Gear, shirts, pants, and a lot more, all made for martial artists by martial artists. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>